right, everybody. Welcome to the CB Giddy Workshop. I'm Ben Giddy, out here at my workbench with another live broadcast here to YouTube for you. Uh, if you were watching yesterday, you know I tried one and uh, trying to get some of the kinks out of the process and the audio wasn't so great. Well, today, hopefully, I got the audio figured out a little bit better. So just to kind of give that a test. Gonna play a little bit for So just a little bit of musical interlude there to get us going. I've got a lot of different uh, screens and stuff all uh, going at the same time here. I don't really know if I'll be able to see live comments this time. I, I tried to uh, tried to have it set up here, but I don't know exactly how that works yet. We are still working on some of that there. So uh, welcome. Thank you for watching. There we go. Now I got comments visible. All right, so thank you for watching. My talk today is talking about building guitars from old wooden Now, of course, a lot of people, a lot of us have built guitars from cigar boxes, like this little hobo fiddle here, built from an old cardboard Phillies cigar box. But we don't have to be limited by that. We can expand our building. We can expand our, our repertoire, if you want to call it that, and use some other stuff for building cigar boxes. Now, I do want to say, you're going to hear some background noise. Uh, this is an active shop. You can see stuff going on behind me. Jason over there, you uh, working on laser, and, and Jake back there pounding in frets. And just off camera over here to my left, we got our very own Glenn T. Watt back in the uh, Giddy shop, working on an order of fretless canjos for a whole workshop he's going to be doing very soon. So I'm pretty excited about that. So if you are out there watching today, if you're tuned in, uh, there's a, a little click down thing you can do on YouTube to chat, send a chat message. Let me know you're out there. Let me know how it's sounding. Let me know how it's all looking. I'm trying out a lot of new stuff all at the same time here. So I'm hoping it's gonna work out uh, well, especially with better audio than we had yesterday. All right, so building guitars from things other than cigar boxes. If you did tune in to or see yesterday's broadcast, you know that I was doing a little bit of follow-up work on this guitar. I had to fix some of the frets that were raised up and causing string buzz. Uh, that They were raised up and having issues because I rushed a little too much when I was putting this guitar together. I got in a hurry. I wanted to see how she sounded. So then I had to go back and do a little bit of cleanup. little bit of buzz on some of them but it, it's back to within acceptable ranges and if you watched yesterday you'll know that at the very end I had fixed the frets I had uh, refiled some things and then I put a wheat penny there underneath one side of the bridge just to help it uh, go so Michael Capato saying that the audio levels are still low so I'm going to come in here and try to give them a little bit of a not too much of a boost. I don't want to overdrive. All right. Let's see. Let me know how that's doing, uh, Mike. Yes, I am wearing a, a lav mic directly wired in. I was wearing one yesterday, but it was a wireless setup, and it turned out to not actually be handing anything off to the, uh, <laughs> to the tablet that was running. Anyway, so yeah, yesterday's audio was bad. Today's audio hopefully will be a lot better. Thank you for letting me know it seemed a bit low. Now we're running right about at uh, 
right near the edge of overdriving. So let me know if that's a little better, Michael, and thank you. So anyway, yesterday I was working on this guitar, and of course this I built from an old explosives crate. If you didn't see the Builder's Blog uh, photo diary I did, it's on the CB Giddy web uh, Facebook page. One of the albums on there, you can see all the photos I took while I was building this. This started off as a much larger wooden crate than it ended up with. Uh, a lot of these wooden boxes, a lot of these wooden crates, they're not ideally sized to be guitar bodies. They're too deep, they're too big, they're too tall. Uh, so you have to do a little bit of, of tweaking, a little bit of working to make a suitable guitar sized from them. I got here, an example. Uh, actually, Farley had done this one a long way back. Uh, this is an old Rumford baking powder box. Now, this box, I believe, started off this size. So this is how big it was. Um, so Michael says, tweak the sound back a little bit. It's tricky. This control is tricky to change, let's say. So I think if it's not too bad where it is, I'm just going to try to leave it there and hope it's good. All right. So uh, this was a Rumford box. Now, she put a piece of old tin ceiling on here, intending that to be the soundboard. Uh, she got about this far into it, and then it got put under her bench and not really touched since. I might try to, uh, I don't know if I'll keep this. Uh, tin ceiling or not, it seems like it'd be awfully hard to keep that from being a rattle trap, if you know what I mean by that, to keep it from rattling as you play, because once you start vibrating stuff, it, uh, well, it can start vibrating <laughs> and have a rattle. So I'm just going to pop this top off of here and see what she had going on inside this old baking powder crate. Now this crate is not necessarily representative of one you might find at an antique store, a junk shop, wherever, you know, a roadside uh, sort of uh, antiques mall or something. So it looks like in here she had put some bracing in there around the edges, and it looks like that's part of an old church pew we had at one point, and then uh, put this piece of tin ceiling in there as a resonator. I don't know. Someday I want to finish this off and make an actual guitar out of it. Maybe I'll use this, I don't know. Anyway, that's not the one I'm starting on today. Now, just as another example, another recent guitar I built was this one, which was built, the Casey Jones, built out of an old Coke crate, an old Coca-Cola crate that I modified. I actually, Farley had started it and got the soundboard on, then I took over, attached the neck to it, and it came out pretty good. a good example of some of what using larger boxes does for you. This is a six string. So it's a bigger, bigger box, bigger soundboard. Uh, I did a wider neck, was able to put more strings on it. So using, uh, like kind of, I don't want to say moving beyond cigar boxes, but expanding beyond just cigar boxes. Because of course we love cigar boxes. Cigar box guitars are the flagship of the whole movement but oh, broadening your horizons a little bit. And that's what I'm gonna start on today. So I wanna say again, thank you and hello to Michael Capato. And now we got Michael Christ out there. Thank you for tuning in and watching. This is still kind of an experimental thing here, doing live broadcasts directly to YouTube. Um, but I wanna give it a try and uh, see how it goes. Cause I know a lot of people are becoming pretty frustrated with Facebook. So limiting ourselves just to Facebook doesn't seem like a a great plan going forward. Uh, Michael Capato asks, is there a truss rod in the neck? No. I have to go on record as saying I have never put a truss rod in a neck yet. Someday I might. Uh, the reason I didn't in this one, Michael, is it's solid 100-year white oak, but it's also, I put nylon strings on it. Nylon strings, much lower overall tension on the neck. 
So the oak with the fretboard laminated on, more than strong enough to stand up to the tension of the nylon string. So no, no truss rod. Someday, someday I'll try one. Just like someday I'll try actual bracing soundboard. Um, as I was building this one, the Dynamite Crate guitar, someone posted a comment on one of the photos that I had put on Facebook saying, get that soundboard thinner and brace it. You'll have much better acoustic sound. And I know that he's correct uh, about that. I've, for some reason, I've always been a little bit scared or, or had some trepidation about bracing. But fortunately, this same gentleman, John S., is his uh, handle on cigarboxnation.com. He actually has an article on there where he shows how he braces his soundboards. So on the next one, maybe this one, I'm going to try that. Gonna take that soundboard down thinner, brace it, and see what it does for my acoustic tone, acoustic volume. So there's a couple of examples of guitars I've fairly recently built from non-cigar boxes. Uh, one of them from an old crate that I uh, took down. Now here's what I've picked out for my next <laughs> victim, my next subject. This old wooden we've had around here for a while. I don't really remember where I got it, but as you can see, it's standardized line, clean cut nails and tacks, which to me is like, I mean, it's not the most exciting graphics. It's not the most exciting subject. It's not dynamite. It's not whiskey. It's not gunpowder. It's not bullets, but it's nice, clean, clear text on a, a, and it's in good shape. It's not rotted, it's not uh, eaten. This one, the crate that this, that I made this guitar from, it was rotten, it was worm eaten. You can see here on this bottom side of the soundboard, hopefully, if I get the light right, uh, there are some worm holes and such that where it was in pretty bad shape and I had to do some fortifying of it with glue and other things to try to sturdy it up and steady it up. So I want to use this box, this old wooden crate. It's got good graphics on both sides, decent graphics on the end. Somebody wrote USMC at the top. I'm not sure what exactly that uh, indicates. It's on both sides. It, uh, you know, of course, it makes one think of the U United States Marine Corps, why they would have had a standardized line nails and tacks. I don't know, so there's a story behind this box that's unknown. But of course, this box would not make a great cigar, or make a great guitar body as is, would it? It's, it, in any dimension, it's just not right. It's not the right size, it's not the right shape for a guitar body. Now, you might be thinking, well, you could make a cello or a bass or something out of it. You're right, certainly could. But here's the problem, I don't want to. I want to build a guitar out of it. Probably another three string open G guitar, much like this uh, dynamite crate back here. So I'm going to follow pretty much the same process with the crate as I did with the dynamite crate, which is you got to get it to the right size. Well, how do you do that? Step one is to identify the panel you want to be your soundboard. And for me, both of these side panels are about the right, you know, they're within range of being the right size. It's going to be kind of a long, a little bit narrower guitar. I mean, imagine if this was the front of the guitar. It's a little longer, a little narrower than this one. This one actually, well, we'll get to that. Options to make it a little less narrow. I actually added extensions onto here. You can see the glue lines if you look closely. Maybe. You see the glue line along the top here and along the bottom where I added panels on there to make it just a little bit wider. So that's always an option if you've got a little leftover wood. Now if you look at this one here, let's see if we can zoom in with the good light. You'll see maybe along the side here there are two boards joined together to make this top panel. That is the same on both ends, where it's a join of two boards, but they're joined with a sort of toothed 
uh, tongue and groove sort of join there, which is nice. So as I take this apart, I want to be very careful to try to not destroy or exceedingly uh, crack up either side, because I've got to get my soundboard, I've got to get a back, I have to have my side panels that form the sides of this box. So I'm going to start trying to take this apart. Now the good thing about a lot of old boxes is they might be a little loose. Just by pushing on this, I can start to get a gap there, which is going to make it a little easier. The sound on that, that's probably good and loud for you, but hey, there's no way around it. Actually, there is one way around it. I could go, hey Glenn, can you grab me the orange mallet, or the rubber mallet, the black one? Yeah. Thank you. Glenn Watt, ladies and gentlemen. A little less uh, loud. Now, as I start to bang on this, I suddenly notice that the bottom panel kind of holds all of the other panels in place. It uh, looks like the sides were built and then the bottom was put on. So if I start trying to get these sides off, as I was starting to do there, I'm going to run into trouble. They're not going to want to come off and wood's going to start splitting and cracking and tearing. So I've realized now that I've got to get this bottom off first and it'll make things a lot easier. So we can see, I don't know if you can see or not, but there are kind of large flathead nails that were used to assemble this. And I'm using a, uh, what are these called? A breaker bar, super bar. And where the tooth is, or where the, the notch is there in the thing, I'm trying to get on either side of where that nail is. So I don't want to be fighting that nail. So I pound it down in, work it out a little. Pound it down and work it out a little. Now this formed of two panels with a tongue and groove join. So I'm trying to be careful not to break those, those tongues or grooves off. So I'm just going to go around. I'm not going to try to force one side off all at once. I'm doing a little at a time, just kind of giving it a gentle pry, working that bottom piece off of the frame, one little bit at a time. Because with these big, kind of large nails that were used, and they might be original, maybe they were put in later to try to, uh, you know, reinforce it. And then I just keep working around. After a while, I don't really need the hammer anymore because I've got enough of a gap. And just kind of little bit, you know, eighth inch, quarter inch at a time. I'm getting a little bit of cracking and loss there from the join. I'm not as worried about that because this bottom panel will probably, I don't know if it's going to end up having a role in this guitar that this ends up being. It might make part of the, the back on this guitar. I didn't have a, enough wood left over from the original to form the back, so I actually took another old wooden box apart and got the back panels out of it. You know, it's one of those things. I would have loved to have had it all come out of the one, but it just wasn't happening. All the, the wood was rotten, and I didn't want to, uh, well, there was no way, really, to use it. So I'm getting this close to being a part now. Peace. Yeah, these, these are some big nails. <laughs> um, I switched from my breaker bar to this little hammer, little claw hammer. All right, so there I've got the bottom off. Get rid of any lingering nails. And I'm just gonna go ahead and denail the uh, these panels, especially this one laying on the floor with the nails sticking up. That's a good, good thing I've had my tetanus shot lately, huh? So 
So depending, a lot of these old boxes, a lot of these are made out of softwoods, you know, pine or, or spruce or whatever was handy where they were put together. Whatever the most common local wood was, was probably would have been built out of. All right. Set these nails aside. And there isn't any really reasonable reason for saving these nails, but just in case later on I find a reason to use them, maybe when I reassemble my sound box, maybe I can carefully drill and put these same nails back in. Uh, not as much for structural reasons, but for decorative reasons, you know, retaining as much as possible of the bits of the original crate seems pretty cool. Okay. So uh, I haven't seen any comments lately. Let me know uh, if everything's still looking good. It's all looking good on this end, but it's uh, hard to tell sometimes from this end how things are going. Michael Christ asks, are they aware nails? I bet he means, are they square nails? No, they're not. These are round, flat head nails, which suggests they're not all that old. But even so, they came out of the crate. If I can find a way to put them back in to the finished uh, product, that wouldn't be too bad. Okay, so here's one panel I've got. Now I noticed on this crate on the top, it looks like there was a top nailed on here at one point. There's a lot of nail holes along the top edge, but that's long gone by the time I got it. GT. All right, so now that I've got that bottom off, I can start on my sides. And here I want to be extra gentle. There's a lot of nails joining these sides. Now sometimes, depending on uh, how tight they are in there. If you get a little bit of a gap, I got about three eighths of an inch pulled up. Sometimes if you pound this back down, the nail heads will all stay up and then you can pry them out. Let's see if that works here. Well, two of them, but that's two more than nothing. That's two out of five which can't hurt, you know, every little bit. But those other ones are pretty deeply seated, so they don't want to come out. So I'm going to leave those for now, start on this panel. Need my quieter. Get that one out about so far, and then see if any of those heads will pop. Only one on this side, but it's the one nearest that finger uh, tongue and groove join. Michael Capato says, head, use the nail heads for fret markers. That's not a bad idea. Could kind of sink them down into the uh, fretboard there, leave a little bit of the shank on, drill a hole. Never tried that, so that's an interesting idea. Okay, so I'm going to get this pried back. Not too much. When you hear that wood start to crack, that's a sign that you uh, need to... There's nothing easier to make when taking apart, when trying to salvage wood. There's nothing easier to make than kindling. I learned that when I tried to take an old pallet apart and I ended up with a pile of broken kindling sticks. Like, huh, well that didn't go well. But this is going a little better here. Just kind of gently easing it, trying to apply pressure from different angles. Because once I get one of these to fully let go, that will hopefully make the rest of them easier. And the closer, the more I get these separated, kind of the more flimsy the whole thing becomes. So I have to be a little caref more careful, carefuler? No, 
more careful with my prying. Get, now I'm prying from inside the box, which from a different angle gives me a little more leverage there. Aha, uh -huh, there's one. Now that that's open, I can gently, this is a dead blow mallet. Tap that off and then doesn't look like I had really started on this one. One good thing about a lot of these old boxes being softwood is that it's a little easier to get them apart than uh, like say oak <laughs> would be. Now I got a bunch of nails sticking up here. I recommend always take those nails out right away. Having Having nails sticking out of boards is just a recipe for injury. It's a bit early yet to start uh, wondering about the resonance of these pieces of wood. They are yellow pine, so it's not what you would call a tone wood per se, but as we've learned with cigar boxes, you know, things that were never meant to make music, never meant to have a voice. Often you can be very pleasantly surprised when you give a voice to something that was never meant to have one. You can be surprised by the, the sound and the tone that it produces. So even though this is yellow pine, I'm feeling pretty confident that it'll make some good music if I don't hose it all up. Okay, just a few more to get out here. Like so. All right. I have now successfully disassembled my wooden box, my clean cut nails and tacks crate. Now, at this point, I have to take a close look at these pieces, these raw materials now that are going to form my new guitar. I'm thinking about what I'm going to be building, what size I want it to end up as, and what pieces I can put together and use to make that happen. I also have to look at any hidden unpleasant surprises in these boards that could cause trouble for a bandsaw blade, for a planer blade, for you know, power tools. And it turns out, in fact, there are some. Take a look here at the back of this end cap piece. You might see some things here pounded into the wood. Those are uh, joining metal, joining clips. I'm not sure what to call them. They're wavy things that are pounded in because this panel is actually made of a couple of, well, it looks like it was to prevent splitting. It looks like this is all one piece of wood. It was all one board, but they popped these in here to help strengthen it. This one, that one has a total of six. This one has four. You can see them in there. That's a problem. If I try to mash this through a bandsaw to resaw it to get it thinner, I'm going to hit those and wreck my blade. If I try to put it through a planer, same thing. So these end pieces are automatically less attractive to me, but the, the downside of that is the lettering they have on there, the stenciling, the writing. I hate to lose, hey look, look who's here, Glenn T. Watt, yeah buddy. Thanks for tuning in there, GT. So. These end pieces also have the name of the company that either built or caused the building of this box. The United Shoe Machinery Corporation. And then there's uh, some additional stenciling that says 72 pounds, four and a half S, pegging nails, pegging nails. Glenn Watt can get on Google there and type in pegging nails and see what comes up. So, these are challenging. Getting those 
things out of there. They don't go all the way through. I don't know how deep they are. Trying to get them, well, let's see. I'm gonna try to dig one out. I've got a, just a pointed awl here, a, a sharp little, what do we call them, scratch awl. Just to try to get an idea of how deep this goes. There's a knot here in the wood, which allows me to kind of get in. Okay, don't want to bend my thing. It looks like, yeah, it looks like it goes in a good ways. I'm going to lie. At least a quarter of an inch. And the amount I'm going to have to wreck the backs of these to try to get a way to get those out probably negates any gain I would get from actually doing so, unfortunately, because I can't even really get a grip on them, at least not enough of one to, no. So that's unfortunate, but hey, that's the stuff you run into with trying to reuse old things. So I'm gonna set these aside for now, maybe. I'll find a way to use them. You know, if I end up with a deep enough box, these could kind of maybe set inside and be the back. Maybe, I don't know. But these are, these two pieces and the bottom, the, the, the bottom of the original box, these are my primary pieces. Now, of course, for a soundboard, thickness matters. Uh, the thinner you can make it, the better resonance it's going to have. But the trade-off with that, of course, is that the thinner it is, the weaker it's going to be. The more fine it's going to be to crack, split, uh, uh, bend and bow under the pressure of the strings down through the bridge. So I'm going to have to turn this, uh, let's see how thick it is. Got my handy dandy digital calipers here. And this is 0.61 inches. So just under 5 eighths, a hair under 5 eighths. And I want it to end up, because I'm going to try bracing, interior bracing on the back of the soundboard for the first time ever, I want to get this down pretty darn close to one eighth of an inch. That's pretty thin. So what I'm going to do is attempt to resaw it on our big bandsaw over there. I got a big 17 inch bandsaw. I'm going to set it up at about 3 sixteenths of an inch. And I'm going to push this through. You lose about 3 16th to 3 30 seconds to the blade. I will cut off here that I can use uh, for something else, maybe for extending the top out so it's a little wider. And I'm, I'm still not 100% sure what exactly I'm going to make from this, whether it's going to be a three string GDG. I apologize again, I don't know how much of the background noise is coming through, but we've got multiple machines running over there, which uh, apparently they make some noise. So, so I'm going to resaw this and then plane it as thin as I can on the planer. Then I'm going to run it through the drum sander down to about an eighth or as thin as I can get it. It's going to take a lot of passes on the drum sander. Uh, I could try the trick of sticking it to another board to get it thinner, as long as what I use for the stickum doesn't uh, mar the surface. I will probably run, no, that's not true. I'm not going to do that uh, because I've also got to get my sides, don't I? To form a box, I need both sides, top and bottom. So this piece, maybe with some help from these, if I cut in between these weird staple things, has to give me my front and back, or my sides, I'm sorry. So, 
I got to start thinking about how big do I want this box to be. Now, the length, I don't really want to change the length. Can you guess why? It's because the lettering goes pretty much the full length or width of the board. And I want all of that to be out there when uh, this guitar is being played. I could take maybe an inch, three quarters. I could, yeah, let me get my ruler out instead of guessing here. I could take this quarter inch of margin on either side. I could take it down to 16 and an eighth from 17 and three quarters. Let's see what I got on this one. This one's 14 and seven eighths. The Coke crate is 15 and seven eighths. This is 17 and three quarters. So this is longer than either of those two. If I take it down, it'll end up just a little over what the Coke crate's at, which I think would be all right. You know, you don't want you don't want too much stuff hanging around. Uh, the other thing this could be, maybe, I've been wanting to build a four string bass tuned E, A, D, G, like a standard electric bass is, because I'd really like in the Juke Shack to have a four string bass, homemade, handmade, out of reclaimed stuff, but have one that's tuned like a conventional bass so that a bass player could come in, sit down, and play it without having to think or, or learn or change anything. That's the same reason I built this guitar. Six string tuned in the conventional six string tuning. So anyone who can play a six string guitar can come in, grab it off the wall, and play something they know. Having a bass that's the same, we've got a couple of basses. We've got the upright and then the the, the two-stringer, but they're both two-string. It requires bass players to change their approach a little bit. Most of them, some of them can handle it, no problem. Others, not so much. So, how long have I been babbling? About 40 minutes. All right, so I got to do some measuring. I think I know my length. So it's going to take up pretty much the full length. I've got eight and seven eighths in height on both of these. So if I want a box depth of, let's see what these are. This, this box ended up a good size, nice depth, but of course it has a quarter inch added to the top and bottom because of the soundboard and then the bottom piece glued on. So the actual side panels of this one are about two and seven eighths, two and three quarters. The Coke crate is about two and seven eighths. So if I take two, two and seven eighths inch pieces off of this, two and seven eighths, allow an eighth for the, the uh, well, if I use the bandsaw, it'd take a little less of a kerf two and seven eighths, two and seven eighths. So I can get three two and seven eighths inch strips out of this side piece. Now, being as long as it is, 17 and five eighths, if I divide that in half, I'm at about eight and, oh geez. 8 and 11 sixteenths, call it. So if I get two long strips and then the third one, and then I cut that third one in half, I would end up with a box. Uh, and if I shorten these long pieces a little bit, I'd end up with a box about 16, let's call it 16 by 8 and 3 quarters. 16 by 8 and 3 quarters. Is that big enough? I don't know. Let's see what this one is. Nine and a half. Ten. So it would work. It'd be almost twice as long as it is deep. Definitely rectangular in nature. Now I do have my back pieces. 
and I have my sides. So these sides, you know, the old end pieces, I could actually build the box around these without reducing their width any, or their thickness, because I really can't because of those stupid staples. I could kind of build a box around these. I could sand these end pieces smooth, glue them together end to end to make a single piece, put that down, and then once this is cut into strips, one strip here, 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 suddenly this is the bottom of my guitar, a little thicker than it, a lot thicker than it needs to be, but I'd be able to use these pieces. It'd make the body a little heavier, or it'd make the whole guitar a little heavier. But I really don't have a way. Well, I could also, I could thin them down on the big belt sander, metal and all, just the big coarse 60 grit belt. <laughs> take it down the old fashioned way get it down to maybe three eighths, yeah. So if I use these for the back, that pretty much locks me into the width. I think that'd be a good sized guitar body. I think. We'd call it eight and three quarter, eight and three quarter. I'd have to do some careful measuring. I think what I'd have to do is get these put together to their final size and that to make sure, you know, because when you're building a box, you, it's easy to, because of the way doing butt joints, you know, like if you can see here, this panel comes out and butt joins on to that. There's no, ang like I didn't do angle cuts or anything. And this box, the size of it actually ended up a little bigger in one dimension than I had planned for. And then I had to do something to fix that. I can't remember exactly. I think that's why the back panel doesn't exactly fit. The back panel's a little smaller <laughs> because the box ended up bigger than I expected. So getting all of this right, because if I build the sides first, slap those together, and then find that I'm off a half inch, like a half inch longer or a half inch wider, you're kind of hosed. Michael asks if there's a way to pull the staples. Well, I started trying to dig in here, if you can see, and tried to get a hold of a corner of it and pry it, and it wasn't inclined to move. Now, that's certainly not an extensive. Uh... Now, see, trying to use side cutters and it splits. I don't think there's a great way to get those staples out without seriously digging in and wrecking a good bit of this wood. And there's four of them in this one, six in this one. So somebody really went to town pounding those in there. So yes, I'm going to just do a little bit. I might need to write something down here. I, I don't always write things down when I'm at the workbench. Sometimes, because I have nothing to write on. Try one of these. Okay. So, what I think will be my nice back panel, when joined together, is going to be, we'll call it 15 and 7 eighths by Excuse me, eight and seven, eight and three quarters. I'm, I'm writing measurements down that are a little smaller because of sanding. I gotta sand these edges clean and smooth before I glue them together to get a nice clean join. So yeah, 15 and seven eighths, that's the back size once joined. So. I do have a little bit of room on either side of the staples. I could take the back down, reduce the width a little bit, or the height, to get it to fit inside. Might end up doing that. 
because my side panels, I can easily get the 16 for the length, but really the length has to go out beyond that to allow for these pieces. So I could reduce this length, reduce that, and then as long as my pieces can get across. Now, I can't forget that I've got the old back too. I could use one of these for the, the, the ends, for the end sides. Use that for that, trim that down all on top. Yeah. The good news is there's plenty of wood here to get done what I need to get done. Two and seven eighths. I might have to re-glue this back together to make it a single piece before trying to cut my join pieces, but maybe not. It, it all, all of this wood has the look, you know, when you're using reclaimed old stuff, especially old wooden stuff, you like it to have the look. You want it to be beat up, you want it to be stained, dented, knocked, worn, gouged. This has all of that, and that's a good thing. So it's going to be, even though the subject is a little boring, it's still uh, good and useful. Now, it's kind of interesting, the United Shoe Machinery, I think I bought this crate up in Farmington, New Hampshire. Not, I used to live in Farmington, uh, not too far from here. There were several shoe factories in Farmington. There were a number of shoe factories here in Rochester. So it's very possible that this box of shoe nails was bought by, shipped to a company here in the local area. These parts were used and then the box was basically garbage, might have been grabbed by an employee of the shoe factory and taken home and stored stuff in it. Maybe a former uh, Marine Corps uh, veteran, maybe stored his uh, military stuff, memorabilia in it. It's hard to know. You know, sometimes you can make up or take what you do know and extrapolate or, or build on that and create a little bit of, of horrible, not horrible, <laughs> historical, <laughs> ah, create a little bit of historical semi-fiction to fill in the blank. The story that should be, the story that should have been uh, behind a guitar, you know, what might have been. That's what I kind of did with the hobo fiddle creating a fictional account of Three String Sam, who invented the hobo fiddle out along the railroad track somewhere using uh, stuff that he had available from scrap piles and whatnot. And interestingly, Shane Spiel just yesterday posted a video showing him installing some copper wire state, uh, frets on a one string diddly bow instrument. And I've long been wanting to try that because in my mind, a, a hobo, you know, didn't have no money, didn't have nothing, didn't have a home to go to out there along the tracks. How would a hobo make a fretted instrument? He ain't going to have a fret saw and fret wire and all that crap. But he would be able to find some lengths of wire, fencing wire or copper wire, and be able to wrap that around his neck and twist it tight and kind of pound it down exactly the same way Shane Spiel shows in that video he posted yesterday. I believe he posted it here on YouTube on the, on the Shane Spiel channel. So I want to give that a try now because my goal is to make as authentic as possible a hobo instrument like an actual hobo would have built and get a tune out of it. And if I can gather up all the parts, ideally found parts along and about and around and then go out by an old railroad line and actually put it together, sitting there in a <laughs> in a uh, modern day hobo jungle. So we all have our dreams, folks. Some of them are just crazier than others. So I think what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get this glued and clamped, this back panel. I'm gonna get this tongue together because I may need this to be effectively a single piece of wood. Now there is one other thing I want to do before I even do that. If, if it's the tool I need is actually in here. I don't think
think it is. It's over in the big toolbox. Uh, it's kind of a uh, high-tech cheater thing, but before you start mashing wood through your bandsaw, which I'm going to have to do with this to thin it down and resaw it, you really want to be sure there's no metal in it. Now, I'm pretty sure there's no metal in this, but I've got a tool that's actually used by metal detectorists, metal detector enthusiasts. It's a little wand that basically beeps and vibrates when it's near metal. And if you run that over a board, it'll let you know if there's any, like a part of a nail. Maybe they try to, a nail broke off in there and, and you don't know. When you're reclaiming wood, being sure there's no metal in it is a good thing because you gotta, resaw blades aren't cheap. And if you hit a nail with one, that can be a lot of money right down the drain. So I'm going to double check these before I start resawing them. And uh, yeah, I think I've got a plan. I'm going to, after I turn the video off, I'm going to put on my safety gear, go over to the big bandsaw, mash both of these through it to get my thinner. Uh, no, not both of them. This is going to be my sides. See? Got to keep track. I'm going to mash this one through it to get my soundboard. Then I'm going to see if I can use some of the piece I cut off. Maybe, nope, can't do that. Never mind. Not going to extend my soundboard. Yep. <laughs> There's a lot to keep in mind with box building. I am not a master box builder. In fact, this one was really my first go at building a guitar, like building a box and then making a guitar out of it. So. All right, I'm going to shut this off now. I'm going to do a little bit of milling and working here in the shop. And maybe, hopefully again soon, uh, do another one of these. Giddy YouTube channel and show you the next steps. Uh, I'll try to maybe try to take some pictures of the in-between steps. But um, if you don't, if you haven't clicked subscribe, I think it is, here on YouTube, to subscribe to the Giddy channel, uh, I'd appreciate it if you did so, so you get notifications about these live events. Hopefully we'll be doing more of them with a little bit more pre-advertising. So thank you very much for watching. I'll uh, see you again soon. Happy building. Build what you play. Play what you love. Now I just have to stop the darn thing. A lot of buttons to mash. There we go.